Let me just say that I have um, a great deal of respect for the Occupy movement. I think that it has found a way to raise issues of uh, inequality and lack of democracy in this country uh, and uh, to challenge uh, the seat of true power in a way that uh, has not been done so far, certainly not through the traditional uh, process or the Democratic Party, that's for sure. So I'm, uh, it's my great honor to be here. It's, uh, I'm happy to have driven up from Detroit to speak with you, give you a few of my thoughts about this, these issues. And I'm going to talk specifically about the um, uh, Public Act for the Emergency Manager Law and what try and inform you as far as I can about the progress of litigation so far. Um, but I'd like to step back for just a moment um, and say that I think that the period that we are in uh, is a period in which we are all reacting and reeling uh, from 9-11. And 9-11 not only was a terrorist attack on the United States in which over 3,000 people were killed. Um, tra great, huge tragedy, great tragedy. I was in New York City that day, so I got to see some of the aftermath of it, uh, not far from the World Trade Center, as a matter of fact. Uh, of course, the, the several thousand people who were killed in the United States is nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands of people who've been killed around the world since that time in, uh, in the wake of what we all know has been the U.S. response, so-called response to 9-11. And 9-11 was, I think, uh, both a tragedy for the people who were victimized by it, as well as uh, an opportunity for those people who wanted to undertake or complete or uh, further uh, implement the undermining and destruction of uh, various democratic aspects of U.S. society. Those people are, are best, uh, if you wanted to, to put a face on what happened after 9-11, I suppose Dick Cheney would be a good face to put on it, but he spoke for um, a relatively small number, but it'll, you know, probably a, an absolutely, a, a lot of people who, who were able to benefit both in, in terms of increasing and enhancing their own power and increasing and enhancing their own wealth as a result of it. And so as a result, we've seen the basic institutions of American democracy come under a huge amount of attack um, since then. We've fought two wars based upon both lies and idiocy. Uh, we have um, weakened the role of government in terms of, of helping people but strengthen the role of government in terms of diminishing and destroying our civil rights and civil liberties that are enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Um, we've reduced taxes for the wealthiest since 9-11. We've increased government spending for uh, a few, relatively few, um, war and prison business related companies. Uh, we've allowed uh, uh, the disgustingly wealthy corporations to um, Ana uh, anonymously by politicians through the Citizens United case that was decided by the United States Supreme Court and strongly supported by, by legislators around the country, primarily, of course, Republican legislators who have tried to diminish uh, access to the polls and supported that, the, the purchasing of politicians, which has gone on. Uh, we deregulated Wall Street, which led to the financial bust of 2008. And we've driven the country into debt that created no jobs, weakened the U.S. around the world, and killed hundreds of thousands of people. Now, those have been the, the effects of 9-11. And, of course, the people who were ready to take advantage of, of what happened in 9-11 were ready before 9-11 and, and took full advantage of it, acted very effectively, and, and uh, furthered their own interests. So um, what have been the results? Seen a huge increase in disparity in wealth, um, turned government into an even more unequal form of government, less democratic than ever, and um, thus we uh, 
uh, have seen in the uh, election of 2010 uh, a huge right-wing, vastly right-wing sweep. And uh, that brings us to the emergency manager law. Immediately after the elections of 2010, one of the first acts of the Michigan legislature was to pass the new emergency manager law. Uh, and uh, as a result, and Governor Snyder to sign it, and as a result to threaten poor communities, primarily communities of color all over the state of Michigan. Leading the, this was the leading edge of this assault on democratic government uh, that we have seen, uh, I think, um, throughout the United States. Other states are looking, hope, hoping, I think, the uh, Republican administrations and legislatures in Ohio and elsewhere in the country are looking to see this happen elsewhere. And what does the emergency manager law do? Well, before the emergency manager law was passed, we had in Michigan a, a law that allowed the governor to appoint emergency financial managers when, the, when uh, governmental units went into uh, economic decline uh, equivalent to a, a situation which might be called bankruptcy if they were in bankruptcy court. Um, and the emergency financial manager then was empowered to take over the finances of, a, of a, a given governmental entity, whether it's a school system as it is in Detroit, or uh, a local government as it is in Benton Harbor. The emergency financial manager was in a position to say, you're not going to spend this much money on your police or your schools or your uh, salaries or this or that or the other thing. We're going to change the budget and we're going to find other ways to to raise revenue if possible. And this was the role of the emergency financial managers who in and of themselves played a rather aggressive and strangulating role on all sorts of city governments. We've seen it happen in, uh, I'm sure it was going on in Benton Harbor before the new emergency manager law. It certainly was going on in, in the, with the Detroit school system. It certainly was going on in the city of Pontiac. And this is what has happened. Well, what was always alleged of, uh, about the emergency managers, which is that these, these people, these emergency managers, really were going to, were taking over the, the role of elected public officials, was now enshrined into real legislation with Public Act 4. Um, in 2010, the, 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 the bill that was signed by Governor Snyder, and, um, and the emergency managers now, in, through the legislation itself, can now come into power, have the power to replace public officials if someone is an elected uh, mayor, if someone is an elected school board, if someone is an elected council person or representative of the people. They can be thrown out of office. They certainly can be uh, a, a legislation that was passed. The emergency manager can say, these ordinances that were passed by the Benton Harbor City Council are no good. We're going to uh, write them off the books. We're going to burn that part of the law. And I'm going to pass my own ordinances without any check uh, by either a city council, which was a part of the old law. The city council had to approve it. And many of the actions that were taken by the financial managers, now no more. We're going to do it. No, we don't care what anybody says. We don't care what anyone does. And certainly the people who are elected uh, in these communities will have no say. Excuse me. So that was the law. And um, uh, a group of, um, and among other things, the new emergency managers can uh, unilaterally cancel contractual obligations that the old <coughs> excuse me that the old governmental unit had entered into, and of course this was primarily sig significant with respect to labor unions, public employees unions, who no longer could rely on anything that they had bargained for previously. It was all subject to unilateral um, cancellation. Um, by the new emergency managers who would basically engage in their own unilateral collective bargaining. Whatever you agreed to, whatever was arrived at through collective bargaining in the past is now off the board. We're going to write it. I'm, whatever I say, is that's what it's going to be. That's why I think this law has been um, 
uh, often referred to as a dictator's law. A group of organizations, labor unions, AFSCMEs led the way, and I give them great credit for it. Um, lawyers and, and citizens from around the state of Michigan put together a lawsuit which has been filed here in Ingham County Court, Circuit Court. In fact, uh, there's a hearing this coming week on Wednesday, I think, uh, in front of Judge Aquilina. If, uh, check with me if anyone, I mean, since it's right down the street and some of you are staying here, check with me. I'll let you know what time it's going to be and maybe you can uh, come and sit and watch the proceedings. It, it should be interesting. Um, anyway, uh, we, a lawsuit was put together through the efforts of a great number of people. Uh, and that lawsuit has a, a handful of rather significant constitutional challenges to the law. And these constitutional challenges have been constitutional challenges raised under the, uh, the Michigan Constitution. Uh, I might point out that there may be a role for a federal, subsequent federal constitutional challenge. The Michigan courts are not known as progressive or even, um, in my opinion, um, courts which, which follow precedent. It's hard to say there's a rule of law in Michigan often because the Michigan Supreme Court is so um, um, unpredictable and I think skewed in, uh, in favor of uh, the interests of the powerful and the wealthy. Uh, but it, this case was started in, uh, in, in state court in Michigan for a number of uh, important tactical reasons. And the, the essence of the lawsuit is to challenge three or four aspects of this new law under the Michigan Constitution. The first is that it is a, uh, that th this new legislation constitutes an attack on, um, on, on our traditional Republican form of government, and that's a small r, everybody, uh, and meaning that the idea that people have had uh, through uh, our, our traditional institutions of democracy that we as, as people who live in a community have the power to elect those people who will control the affairs of that community. The idea of electing politicians themselves has now been severely undermined, if not eliminated, totally through this new legislation. And that violates the, the Michigan Constitution and in, in many of its uh, portions, in particular the Due Process Clause. Another element of the challenge, legal challenge, is through the doctrine of separation of powers. And separation of powers means that, uh, that one branch of government can't jump into the, into the, the tent uh, of another uh, branch of government, can't, can't jump into their arena. Uh, and in this case, what we have is we have the governor appointing the, the emergency manager and the emergency manager, therefore, is, a, uh, is an organ or an extension of the executive branch of government. And then the, uh, the, this person gets in power uh, and starts legislating in local communities. As I said, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, uh, eliminate uh, laws that have been passed by elected branches of government in the past. They can pass their own laws. And they then become both an executive and a legislator, and this is what's known as, uh, as a um, basically uh, uh, unlawful delegation of power. The Michigan legislature has passed the statute. The governor now has the power to appoint people uh, who are part of the executive branch and then go back to legislating and, and ex executing those laws, and it, 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 it blurs the distinction that we have seen between branches of government, which is an important one for, for any checks and balances system and for any idea of preserving democracy that you have different branches of government which speak to different interests of the, elect, of the electorate. In this case, you have an emergency manager who speaks to nobody's interest in, in any of these communities. These communities are now deprived of the ability to govern themselves. So we have A, just sort of the Republican form of government argument, and now B, the, uh, the illegal delegation of power doctrine. And C, we have a, a, a challenge under what's known as the Hadley Amendment to the Michigan Constitution, which, said, which is basically an unfunded mandate 
provision in the Michigan Constitution that says the state of Michigan cannot force local communities to um, uh, to uh, pay for uh, things that they haven't voted on. In this case, the emergency manager comes armed with lawyers, with accountants, with assistants of all sorts that he or she may want to bring into the mix. And these are expenses that are paid for by the city of Benton, by the vote, by the taxpayers of uh, Benton Harbor, by the taxpayers of Pontiac, by the taxpayers of Detroit uh, for purposes of the schools. All of these things now are un unmanned, are are uh, unfunded, man mandated, um, what, am, what am I looking for? Unfunded mandates, I guess. Or, anyway, unauthorized mandates uh, to, to pay for things and violate the Headley Amendment. Those are the, essentially the three challenges. Um, now, I know that you, the people who are involved in the Occupy movements around the country are very uh, primarily concerned or principally concerned with issues of, um, of economic democracy and equality and, uh, and commendably so. I'd like to just, by the way, go back to the EFM thing for one, one moment. There, there are petitions outside and there is a petition drive to have the voters of the state of Michigan vote on the emergency manager law. And if you have not yet signed such a petition, it would be great if you would uh, who's the circulator of the petition? Justin, right? Justin. Dustin, excuse me, back in, at the back of the room. And he can help you sign. And we also need people not only to sign these things, but to circulate them. If we haven't got enough signatures, and I don't know where the count stands at this point, but if we get enough signatures uh, on, uh, on these various petitions, uh, we can get them smatter on the ballot and maybe have the kind of success they saw in Ohio uh, at the last, during the recent election in Ohio, uh, here in Michigan, and it will stop the execution of this emergency manager law once it is, once it has been authorized to go on to the ballot. So I uh, urge everybody to get involved in that. Um, let me just say that I think that uh, I, I was saying that there's a, a you know the issue of economic justice has been has been raised to the forefront lately, and that's important uh, and commendable, as I said before. It's clearly tied into the issue of, of uh, uh, well, political rights, of the, the civil and, and constitutional rights, as, as exemplified by the uh, by the Bill of Rights and by the Civil War amendments. And um, so I think that we have seen an assault in so many ways on so many aspects uh, of our political rights that I, 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 it just needs to be noted that this has been under attack. As I started out by saying, it's been under attack since 9-11, certainly probably, certainly before that as well. And part of the struggle needs to be organized to fight back so that these rights are protected. Um, I'm not going to read through the Bill of Rights for anybody or go through all of the rights, but I think it's the idea of what constitutes a democracy in the society is pretty simple. It doesn't require uh, uh, it doesn't require a graduate degree of any sort to understand it or to put it into play and practice or to make demands that we have these things. Um, uh, I think that uh, one could go and talk to a, a group of third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders and explain this pretty, pretty simply. And uh, I think we all have to keep it in mind in going forward in this struggle because all of these rights, along with the right to have a level of equality, economic equality in the society, are under attack. Let me just, if I can, quickly define these rights for you and see if we can talk about it or just mention it a little bit. The one is the right to be free from uh, unreasonable seizures, arrest, and detention. Uh, we all understand that. You can't arrest uh, someone unless there's a good reason for doing it. We'll just call this probable cause. You can't hold someone without charging them with a crime. They can't be locked up indefinitely. 
They can't be uh, tortured or while they're being arrested, locked up. They can't be subjected to excessive force or torture. Another one is our, our homes, our bodies, our communications, uh, and the areas where uh, there is an expectation of privacy uh, cannot be uh, intruded upon by the government or by anyone else unless we agree to it or permit it, um, or unless there's evidence that there's criminality. They can't. Another one is speech and protest. We can say what's on our minds and in our hearts um, with uh, um, exceptions for things like I've got a gun and I'm going to take your money from you unless you give it to me. But basically we can say, we can speak politically and speak morally and speak about ethics and what's right and what's wrong and no one can get in the way of that speech or that expression. And we can organize groups to do that and we can assemble with people we with whom we agree or want to talk about with this thing. Another one is, of course, religion. And religion includes not only the, the freedom to express religion and, and, and practice our religion, but it's a freedom to, uh, there's a freedom built into the Constitution and the First Amendment to be free from religion if anyone wants to impose it upon us, including the government. Um, we have a right to free and fair elections um, in which votes are counted fairly and each vote counts equally. Uh, and we have a right to a separation of powers of government, that one branch of government can check the, the power and authority of another branch of government, and that's another form and way in which democracy is protected. Now, there is not one area that I've just briefly described here that has not been under serious attack, certainly since 9-11, and under increasing attack since, the, the, uh, since we've seen these insane right-wingers take over our governments all over the country, including here in Michigan. Um, I, I, I think what, what people are doing here in the Occupy movement here in Lansing and around the country is so admirable and commendable, as I've said before. It's fighting back, and I applaud it. Um, <coughs> the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre was, uh, wrote a book in which he quoted a, a good friend of his who was going to fight in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s against fascism. And, he, and Sartre was saying to the guy, you know, you, you, could get, you probably will get killed down there. Don't go. It's dangerous. Don't do it. You, and we're not going to win this fight anyway. They've got the Germans. They've got the Italians. They've got all these powers lined up against us. And his friend turned to him and said, you know, we don't fight fascism because we're going to win. We fight fascism because it's fascism. And on that note, I want to applaud what everyone here is doing and call on Reverend Pinckney to come on up and join me for questions and answers here. <laughs>